Hello and welcome to Cultivating Victory Live. I'm Dr. Mary Lucero and I'm here today with our special guest, Melissa Davis. Melissa lives in Longmont, Colorado and is basically building her own homestead. And she's going to share with us some information today about herbs and things many of us think about as weeds that have a lot of value. So before I turn it over to her, I'm just going to include our disclosures here and point out that we are not here to diagnose, treat, prevent, or cure disease. We're not here to give any kind of professional advice. This is an idea sharing forum, and we're just exchanging information based on our experience. So with that, I will turn it over to Melissa, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be here with you. Um, the, when Glenn asked me to talk about some of these things, um, our conversation had been on uh, some of the things that our livestock are eating on our properties, um, and having an awareness of what's kind of growing right underneath our feet and what can be utilized easily for our own personal health and, and those of our, of our animals too. So um, I put together just a, a quick subset of some of the uh, things that are considered uh, weeds out in probably what might be considered normal polite society, but amongst us farmers, um, they're valuable tools uh, and uh, need to be treated as such and not uh, eradicate. And so the first one that I, I uh, included a photo of is, this is an early spring shot of a dandelion. And, and you, everybody has them. It's, it's a goal of, uh, of the American homeowner to eradicate these from their lawns. And yet um, this, this is one of the most valuable uh, uh, weeds that, that exists and it literally grows everywhere on the planet um, and the leave the dandelion that we see and experience today in the United States is was brought with the Italians uh, with seeds uh, when they immigrated and uh, it has certainly spread everywhere and um, but that when you consider it as a food source like early spring and going out and I do a, a regularly go out in the spring and harvest whatever is sprouted up out in my garden and the leaves of dandelion uh, from the spring plant are one of the things I include as well. As the summer goes on, the leaves get more bitter, but uh, those early uh, spring leaves are delicious and we often eat them raw, but they contain, you know, as you can see on the slide here, a, a nice amount of potassium uh, for uh, vitality. Um, but the, the health benefits, I I'd like, a one-page slide isn't enough to discuss all of the health benefits of a, of a dandelion. Every part of this plant is beneficial. Flowers, root, leaves, everything. We've even, uh, we did an experiment a couple of years ago and made dandelion wine mixed with a little bit of orange juice and, and lemon juice and oh, that's really good. Um, we, do, we mix it with some club soda as just a fresh spritzer and it's the most beautiful golden color. But uh, if you are curious about how, how to get there, I can answer, answer some questions, but it, it uh, can be a little tedious to sit and pick all those yellow buds off the, off the flowers. Uh, you make the wine out of the flowers. We make the wine out of the flowers. So op open, first day open dandelions uh, before the flowers started to fade at all. So uh, my husband and I went out and we also have bees on the property. So you know, as I have a little sign down here, it, the, the spring flowers on the dandelions are truly very important because they're one of the very first foods, uh, pollen sources for the bees in the spring. So uh, one of the reasons uh, um, to keep them around is to feed the bees, if, if that's at all important to folks. Uh, when we went through and we picked all the dandelions that we did for, for our wine, Believe it or not, we left some flowers on some of the plants so that the bees could have them. Uh, we share here. Um, my normal uh, process for with dandelions here and with any of these plants that are considered weeds is um, I allow them to grow in the margins, so to speak. So the large cultivating beds that I use for growing our other plants and, and things, I don't usually let what uh, these plants grow in there. I'm, I'm uh, 
having kind of a focused relationship and do a lot of companion planting. But uh, there are some some herbs that can be, or of these plants that can be a little bit invasive if, if they're left to their own devices. So I might uh, pick them, and uh, but they don't go to waste. Uh, all of these things are fed to my rabbits, uh, or my pigs, or my chickens, or my turkeys. Um, everything gets fed. I share this with all of them. So um, the dandelion, I mean, the things that it, it can do for you, um, yeah, amazing. And as, as you look, uh, so in the spring, the leaves being great for a source of potassium. In the fall, you can taste, take and, and uh, dig uh, some of the nice large tap roots after they've developed, roast them, use them for coffee through the winter. And uh, it also promotes really he uh, healthy gut bacteria. So as you consider our soil a biome, your body is another biome, and uh, having a great relationship uh, with the bacteria that you've got going on in there can help you uh, keep your body strong through the winter so you're not susceptible to bugs. I don't consider healthy gut bacteria as bad bugs. So, so any questions about the dandelion? I do have some in my garden that I let let's stay. I've got some very bad soil that I'm working on remediating, mm -hmm. but they are getting invasive. Yeah. And so I've been debating whether to pull those out or, or wait. Yes. I think it's a kind of a subtle dance looking for balance. If they start to take over and just the one, one protocol you can use is just deadheading them. That'll help maintain some control. So then you get the, the benefit of it the root, that tap root, opening up the compacted soil that you have um, and bringing the, the helping with uh, bringing the, the bacteria into the soil there uh, to increase the nutrients and stuff available in the soil. But I, I'm a big believer in just deadheading too. Like you can eradicate thousands of unwanted plants just by pulling a flower head when it's, when it's served its purpose. Look for balance. If it feels like it's overwhelming to you when you look at it, you might have too many. So dig them up, roast the roots, <laughs> boil <Yeah>. them up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my daughter actually likes bought a dandelion spice tea from our. Oh, interesting. I wonder what else is I in it. This so I need to I need to play with getting that right. Oh yeah, using our you're growing it right in your backyard. So the next one that I'm showing is a variety of plantain. Uh, this is another one that people will work to eradicate from their gardens and in their yards. And it's such a beautiful plant. And this variety, actually, I bought these seeds from somebody, which seems like such a crazy thing to do. But if you look at the red on those leaves, this plant is actually a very beautiful specimen. By the end of the season, the leaves of this plantain have, um, are about the size of my face. They're really big. I also have uh, the variety that's more native to our area where the leaves are just about the, the size of your palm. But they're, the leaf uh, veining structure starts down here and uh, you know, fans out and it makes a nice kind of ovate leaf. Um, and then they have the, the stem that sticks up where the seeds are tightly clustered uh, around the stem. I feed every part of this uh, to my rabbits also. It's, also, it's another one of those amazing plants that grows in places that are not, uh, where other things aren't growing. It has a much more fibrous root system than the uh, dandelion does. So it's more working at the top level of the soil as opposed to the deep breaking up, but um, still a vital, a, a vital job to be done as far as uh, our lands are concerned. Uh, this is another one of the plants where I, when I'm out with a bowl picking my spring salad, the young leaves of, uh, of a plantain go into that bowl too. When they, they get bigger, they're, they're uh, fibery, so they're not as palatable, but you can, you can still eat them. Um, this is also in my arsenal of, of, of things uh, that I consider to be a vital tool to have on hand as an herbalist. Um, this, this herb, if you're, I've been out in the garden, my husband and I've been, uh, last year we went to Saratoga Springs, Wyoming for an anniversary, and we were sitting out on the patio uh, deck of a restaurant, and a wasp came out and stung me right on my, on the back of my arm, <laughs> a nice tender spot, and uh, my, my 
immediate response was, oh, I'm in a place and I don't have my herb kit with me. And my husband looked over the rail and he said, they don't spray. There was a little grass area behind. He's like, I don't think they sprayed out there. So I went out and looked and sure enough, there was plantain and mallow, which I'll show you a, a picture of a little bit later. But I uh, picked a leaf of the, of the plantain, put it in my mouth. Uh, chewed it a couple of times and uh, stuck it on the on the sting and almost instantly the the, the burning sensation of that sting was gone. Uh, I can't I can't say enough about the benefit of this one. I also use it in my uh, topical uh, skin oils. Uh, it, it soothes. It helps repair your skin. Um, and on if you are eating it, it serves a similar kind of purpose through your your body, your respiratory, your uh, urinary tract, and your GI. Um, very, very soothing and helping to heal irregularities wherever there may be in, in your system. So not a weed either. Are there things that look like plantain that you would want to avoid? You know, that's an interesting question. I think it, that's going to be de very dependent upon where you live. Um, the The Probably the best thing to do is to uh, look up the picture of plantain in your area, but growing in, in your lawn, if it's been sprayed um, or if it's on like the edge where the, the even the edge of the, uh, where spraying may have happened uh, for like mag chloride, those salts and stuff, you don't want to eat those plants. But um you know, it looks like just a little rosette growing in your grass. Um, and there'll usually be many of them because they, they colonize. Um, I would look up and see what this looks like in my environment. Um, like I said, this is a, this is a variety that I bought from uh, the South, uh, North Carolina, because I like the red leaves. Um, but I have it set up in a separate place in my garden from my other ones. And, um, uh, yeah, I'd want to know exactly what it looks like in my yard. That's a great question. Um, uh, and, but I would for sure look it up. I, I actually pick and cultivate or pick the leaves off of this plant all summer long and dehydrate it and keep it in a big jar and feed it to my rabbits through the winter. So, um, and, well, and I use it uh, in my herbal oil infusions as well. So this one is mullen. Um, so as this grows, it's going to get a, a big, tall spike that comes out the top of it uh, with uh, the yellow flowers that, that form on it, too, all around that spike. Uh, it's a biennial. So this is a, a uh, mullen out in my garden that started last year. It was about half that size last year. In this spring already, it's uh, uh, gotten a lot bigger. Uh, it's already growing. And... And again, another vital bee food, um, not an early spring one, but uh, all through the summer, all of the pollinating uh, insects, wasps, and uh, the non-honey-making non bees and such will be swarming all over mullen. Um, the leaves, the, the flowers, the root, again, all can be used. Um, the leaves, uh, Native Americans, First Nation people here in the United States would use them as a field dressing for wounds also. So they has that fuzzy, uh, hairy texture to the leaf of, uh, that other verbascum has and uh, is uh, very powerful in, uh, in, in that manner. So the leaves, um, you know, it's, it's funny that there's, I heard an old wives tale that uh, the leaves on a, for, well, you'll see a lot of, mullen growing the summer before it's going to be a tough cold season for respiratory colds so i'm not sure if that's true or not but i do look at uh, uh the growth of these plants and there are years when there's a big big crop of them and there are years when they're when you know there's only a few of them i let i don't let these take over the garden either because some of them can get to six feet and they'll take over the universe if you allow in a place where there's water and uh, very healthy soil. So these guys get relegated to the margins of my garden as well. 
that I appreciate their stature and their beauty as much as any other flower in my garden. Um, and it's fun to go out and uh, over the course of the summer, I'll harvest the flowers uh, out, of, out of the stem. And it could be tedious if you view, if you view a task like um, where you're pulling tiny flowers out. Um, but it can also be rather meditative as well. Uh, you got to watch for the bugs uh, so you don't get, uh, interrupt the bees as they're doing their business. It's kind of one of those balanced things. Don't take all the flowers and the bees will leave you alone. But uh, this is one where I always keep some oil infused with the flowers in my uh, first aid cabinet uh, to treat any kind of ear ailments for myself or the critters. Uh, rabbits can get ear infections, although my rabbits haven't had anything like that in quite some time. Um, but uh, you put a drop or two in your ear and rub it in and whatever's bothering your ear is gone. Um, it's amazing stuff. Okay, and this is one of the ones that Glenn and I were talking about when we were visiting about some of the the flowers that, that grow um, and the plants that grow that he sees his animals eating. He wasn't real sure about what this one was. So this is mallow, and this is as, as it looks in the early spring. So it's just come through winter, so it's looking a little caloric, <laughs> some yellow leaves on it, but uh, uh, these grow on the edges of my garden beds. So you can see the rabbit manure <laughs> around this because over the course of the winter where the rabbit manure from uh, my bunnies goes is right onto all my garden beds. So these, I keep them from growing any place but right along the edge of my garden beds. And uh, another spring favorite to include in our, in our salad, as the leaves get bigger, you can eat them, but they're hairier. So I don't like the texture as much as I do the, the little tiny leaves. Um, but it'll grow, this variety grows prostrate to the ground and gets um, little pinkish purple flowers on it. And the seed heads, um, this is uh, one of its common names is cheddar cheese plant. So its little seed heads look like little wedges of, of cheese, uh, but I don't let it go to seed very much. It gets fed to my rabbits again, and I harvest this again all, all summer long and dry the leaves and feed it to the rabbits over the winter. So keep their, keeping their uh, uh, gut healthy during the winter when they can be susceptible to uh, the yuck sitting in, not sure what else to call it, but it seems to help them. It's a very mild laxative. Um, so like I said, it helps keep, keep that system cleared out. Uh, this is another one of the one plants that when I had that bee sting or that wasp sting last summer, uh, when we were walking back to our hotel, I grabbed some mallow leaves from that grassy area, chewed them up with my, my uh, plantain, and it's like the swelling and the redness went away very quickly. So next day, you couldn't even tell that I'd had a, a wasp sting on my arm. So mm. very, very amazing. Kind of a cooling plant. So this is the buds off of the cottonwood just outside of the house here. We only have one on the property and it's a volunteer. And I'm so grateful for it because it shades our, our chicken coop all summer long. But the sap is an important source for bees. Um, you'll see bees like crawling around on, the, on these buds in the spring and stuff. And what they're doing is they're harvesting some of that sap to use as the propolis, which is bee glue um, and, and a very important tool in an herbalist's arsenal. Um, but uh, in the spring, I picked the buds from this for uh, making balm of Gilead. I have a couple of siblings who have some chronic illness, a brother who's had uh, tumors that have been removed from his, his torso that have left him with some significant nervy damage uh, for when, those, when that muscle tissue was removed with the tumor. Balm of Gilead has been one of the thing, the only topical things that has soothed that nervy pain for him. A little bit of it goes a long way. It's super easy to make. Um, and you can do this without damaging the tree at all. If you, you know, early in the spring like this, when the buds are starting to get fat and you can smell the, the sap, it has a really unique smell to it. 
Some people hate the smell. Some people love the smell. Kind of like cilantro. Love it or hate it. Um, but uh, you can, the, the wind knocks a lot of the branches out of a cottonwood tree. So you can go and you can pick the buds off the downed branches and collect them. You only need about a jar full, maybe uh, three quarters of a, a quart jar. And then you cover it up with oil. Um, I use uh, rice bran oil because my skin doesn't like other types of oils. <laughs> my skin breaks out. Um, but rice bran oil is my, my favorite. But you can you cover up the, the buds and shake it every day. Keep the buds covered. Um, and by the end of a month, you'll have one of the most amazing elixirs. You won't be able to reuse the jar again because the stuff will stain that jar. Um, but it is, it is amazing. And it's growing all along the riverbeds and in the riparian zones uh, all over the United States because there are various forms of cottonwood and all of them are fabulous in this way. Um, the uh, best thing to do is go on the interwebs and you can look at Balm of Gilead and find the directions for making this. Um, simple, simple to do and powerful, powerful uh, tool. Nice. nice. I had never thought about uh, separate species being more important for propolis versus honey versus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, and so that was a little tidbit for me. Oh, but... Yeah. Um, a lot of this is just from watching the, what goes on on the property. And uh, as you know, when you're main, when you maintain livestock, you're probably paying attention a little bit differently than a lot of other folks do because um, the very subtle things are indicators of health or, or disease in, in your livestock uh, for what's going on. So for my bees, I notice, gee, when they're, you know, what days are they out? What are they going to? Uh, which, time, which parts of the year? And I notice them going to the cottonwood and, uh, and harvesting uh, uh, the sap and talk to a couple of other natural local beekeepers. And, you know, that's where I, it's like they're using, that's like a big source of propolis. And then, but it makes sense if you are thinking about what uh, the benefits it has for our body, making the balm of Gilead, then the bees, the bees know. So if you follow, the bees are going to a plant, it's worth us paying attention to. Hmm. It's, it's going to be probably pretty good for us too. So, okay. And then the, uh, the last slide I did for, for you guys uh, is just some of the herbal books that I keep on hand. I have many more than this, but I find that these are the books I go to the most um, that have been the most helpful for identifying anything on, uh, that I don't know what it looks like. Um, but at this point, the, the pictures aren't something that I really use so much. Um, I, the, and the, probably the one that I use the most for um, reference in deciding which herbs I want to use for various things is the Matthew Wood book, the, the Earthwise Herbal. He has a couple of those books out, and I want, there's one more I want to get that he has um, also. And I have a couple of photos there to finish out my salad, my spring salad. I have a picture there of my spring sorrel as it's coming up and salad burnet, which tastes so much like watermelon or cucumber to me. It's amazing. Um, but these are popping up right now on the property. So, I mean, it's March and I can go out and pick a salad. So, these also have herbal benefits too that I can go into. I focused on weeds. <laughs> Excellent. Melissa, it is so nice to hear all these very practical uses for things that are probably on yards in many properties this time yeah. of year. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad to be here. Thank you.